to show a film we made, uh, finished recently, called Permanent Green Light. I am Dennis Cooper, and I'm also here for the exact same reason as Zach, to show our new second film. So Dennis and I made a made a uh, our first film. It was called like Cattle Towards Glow, I think, in like 2015. And uh, we met in Paris. Dennis has been there for like 10, 10, 10 or so years, and. Um, and yeah, I've been reading Dennis as an author. I've been reading him since you know, I was a teenager or something. And uh, when I moved to Paris, we got to meet and pretty quickly started to work together on different projects. And and uh, we got around to making a film somehow. And uh, <laughs> this this is uh, yeah, this is our second film, so it's it's uh, quite a bit different from uh, like Cattle Towards Glow. Um, the, yeah, we, um, yeah, we made this first film, and uh, uh, Zach was a visual artist, is a visual artist, and he'd made videos, but not, a, not an actual film before. And I had always been really interested in making films, but I don't really have a visual sense, so it was kind of a perfect match. So we, and we did the, um, the first film because it was sort of like easy, it was kind of, um, it wasn't easy, but it was... Uh, kind of an experiment because it was really low budget. It was like forty thousand dollars, and we did everything ourselves. And it was kind of, a, I think, kind of a way to test and see if it was something that we could do well. And then we enjoyed it so much that we decided to keep making films. And then, um, yeah, we pretty much when we were work finishing that, we just started thinking of this idea of like, um, it's just like a young guy who would. Kind of like want to disappear that that would be his obsession and um and uh, and then that just we just talked about it and developed it and got us where it is now and uh um sort of like a, a boy who like wanted to be the world's greatest magician is kind of how in a way i think about it by committing everything including his own life to to doing the most amazing magic trick ever so uh yeah and then we just wrote the script and Got found, luckily found a producer who was willing to do it for more than forty thousand dollars, and we did it. <laughs> well, there's the, the, yeah. The, I mean, the original, the original, the kernel or seed was there was a there was this young Australian guy named Jake Bollardi, and uh, he was all over the news, and he he was just this sort of nerdy, odd Australian boy, and he disappeared. And then, and then they discovered that he had gone to Syria, I think, and joined ISIS. And, um, and he ultimately um, became a suicide bomber, although he failed and only blew himself up. But what, I mean, the, the ISIS thing didn't, wasn't, it didn't interest us, but what interested us was that it made absolutely no sense why he would do this, because he'd never been political or religious or anything. And we, we, and we, were, we started talking about the idea of like, what if he had chose, what if he chose ISIS is because it has so much meaning, it's so heavy that he would disappear into it. You know, like that his reason for doing this would never be known because there would be all this, the context was so heavy and meaningful that, so what if it was about him wanting to, wanting to, to, to somehow to make his death a spectacular, a completely mysterious and amazing act. And that's where we started was, was that. And, um, so yeah, we just decided to take the ISIS thing out, although he does, our guy does get it and want to explode himself eventually. But um, that was the kernel, but it's just, the only thing about bringing that up is that it, it seems like it's about suicide bombing. It's not at all about suicide bombing. It's about the, the kind of act of erasure or something that, that was involved in that. So I think, and I think really the, the explosion thing is just, you know, he's a, not a kid who has any money and he lives in a small town. And I think that he just ends up deciding the explosion thing, it's, and it just, you know, it's like he, the building collapses at the beginning and he's fascinated by the sound of it, and it's just kind of that way, and then he starts thinking about the pinatas, and, and, and he just, and, and he meets that girl that has collects his hypothesis, and it just, he ends up deciding to explode, but I, I don't think that, I think that, um, I don't think he's interested in the violence of the explosion. I mean, I think he just thinks of like a fireworks or something, you know, I think he thinks, he imagines it being like, it would just be like, like, like I said, like a magician or something that it would create this explosion and there would be nothing left, you know, which of course isn't the case. 
but um, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't, I have to, I also didn't, um, it is a violent act, but I just, I, I, you know, I mean, it, it, it's more, um, I mean, even though he doesn't think about it, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a violent emotionally on his friends. So, I mean, that's, that's the violence, but he just doesn't want to think about it, that aspect of it. I mean, he's confronted by that because Guillaume, one of the characters, loves him. And this is the big confrontation. It's like, how does he do this to someone who he knows loves him? And that's the only time I think he has to think about it. But I don't think it's, I don't think he thinks of it as, I think he thinks that the explosion is being, yeah, like, like a, you know, puff of smoke or something. Yeah, the, I mean, I guess one of the real challenges going into making the film was that, uh, I mean, we were built, building such a kind of specific world for these characters that's like stripped of, I mean, as much as possible, like trying to like really strip their environment of any kind of like morals or, or um, kind of power relations or like any or norms really. And, um, and I mean, one way, one, one way to do that was to, to kind of create this extremely generic um, surrounding for, for those characters so that the only focus would be, you know, really, really close in on them. And, um, and yeah, the, the, the film is shot on the one hand in, in these uh, kind of social housing blocks that are, that are very dense, but also um, for one of the characters in, in these kind of like suburban like type homes that are all kind of the same and next to each other and and for some for some reason I, I tend to think of those those two situations as like two expressions of the, the same kind of the same kind of like thinking about how to arrange people and um, but yeah so so really trying to really kind of strip the, the surrounding um, as much as possible so that so that you would kind of have to reckon with the, the characters and what they were giving you and what they were not giving you and, and not get get too tied up in the specificity of their surroundings. Yeah, I mean, it's and also just like, because we wanted it to feel really pure. We wanted the audience to have this incredibly close relationship with the characters in the world, you know, to, I mean, like said to the point where the only music in the film is music that the characters hear. It's important that the cinema of it, because you know it's a slow film and it's, it's it's asking you to pay a very close attention to these people you don't know. So we tried to make the composition of the film, you know, pretty interesting, you know, very simple but also very 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 carefully composed. And also a part of it is we really we really worked. I mean, the rhythm of the film is extremely important. I mean, we worked very very hard to create that rhythm through the editing and things. And you know, so it's also like. The compositions are meant to kind of refresh the eye, so there's a lot of thinking about that. It's like so, the thing will be framed, and you know, and, and, it, and the composition's interesting, and you, you notice the composition, it kind of wakes you up a little bit. And the queer film. Yeah, I mean, we're queer when we made it, so I guess that by default it is. I mean, I think that, I mean, we had no sense of making a queer film, but I mean, if you want to parse it, I mean. The, Every single character except for Guillaume has no sexuality or romantic interest in anything there, as far as you know. There's no, they're not defined. Their sexuality, their identity is not defined. You don't know. I mean, you can assume that Roman is probably straight because of his... But I mean, the only... Because what? Because, because he, he doesn't want to sleep with Guillaume. I mean, he says, like, yeah, this isn't my area. So you can kind of assume that, like... I think it's possible to think that Roman is straight. The rest of them, I don't think you have any idea. And um, but the only person whose desire and feelings and, and feelings of love and stuff is in the entire film who that you you're asked to deal with is the queer character. So in that sense, you know, in a way, it's like that's the only character who's allowed to to be to have any kind of queerness or any kind of um, desire or, or, or feeling that's allowed to come into the film. So in a funny way, I mean, uh, because of that, even though he's just one of the characters and that's not a main story, I think it, it probably ends up meaning something that, that he's the one we let show himself that way. <laughs>